Hi, uh, I'm Poonam Valgapudi, an interventional fellow from Brown University, Rhode Island, and I'm here with Dr. Ajay Kirtane from Columbia University, as uh, you all know. Hello, Dr. Kirtane. Hey, <laughs> nice to see you. How are you? I'm great. I see the great red tie in support of Go Red for Women. Yeah, and you have your great fits on the Go uh, microphone, so I think we're all set to go. All right, so um, let's talk about uh, the AHA meeting first. AF and PCI, um, the space is one that is really of interest to a lot of people and there are several other trials coming along but Pioneer kind of leading the way if you will. I'm a little bit of a soft spot for this because Mike Gibson was my mentor when I was a fellow and he was the one who presented it today and led the trial. Um, but it's really important because it's over 2,000 patients and really looking at three strategies. One is sort of a standard warfarin based triple therapy strategy. Mm -hmm. Another one is kind of triple therapy but with a lower dose of rivaroxaban, so DAPT plus two and a half milligrams of rivaroxaban. Not approved here in the United States at that dose, mm -hmm. but definitely elsewhere uh, it's been seen. And then the final was kind of like a Wust-like arm mm -hmm. with 15 milligrams of rivaroxaban plus clopidogrel, um, but no aspirin. And so I think the key thing with this study is it showed that both rivaroxaban arms had lower rates of bleeding complications kind of across the board, major, minor, um, relative to the standard triple therapy with warfarin. And there was no adverse safety signal. Now, the, I think the authors were uh, sort of circumstantial they really did not say that this is definitive proof of efficacy because that would like, really need about six-fold more patients. But the fact that we don't really see a negative signal is reassuring, especially considering the fact that many clinicians, as you know, have already on the basis of WUST changed to just using, you know, clopidogrel and warfarin. So this data, I think, provides further reassurance in that regard. So a pretty big trial for this meeting. That's awesome. So uh, a lot of our patients are on Ticagrelor. So this study was with Clopidogrel. Uh, what would you say? Do you think are we there yet where we could uh, use Ticagrelor with rivaroxaban or you think we have to wait for more trials in that case? You know, my thought is especially when you use more potent antiplatelet agents, more potent inhibitors of the P2Y12 receptor, it's just one of those things where the bleeding will start to go up. And so the whole idea of this type of study is to peel back a little bit, not sacrifice efficacy, but make safety better. So in my mind, going up to either Ticagrelor or Prasigrel would probably increase bleeding more. Um, it may be good for certain patients, and uh, we will occasionally do it. So for instance, what we do, at least in the hospital, is that if we're going to go and adopt a like strategy where we want to drop the aspirin, we actually might check P2Y12 reactivity to clopidogrel. No data for that, but at least you want to be sure they're on some agent. And then if they're resistant, then we might do ticagrelor plus, uh, plus the anticoagulant. So maybe in that situation. But otherwise, I think you're just going to be start, starting to increase bleeding complications. That's great. You actually answered my question. That was going to be my next question to ask you about that. Um, so let's go back to TCT, uh, where Noble and Excel were presented. Um, so can you tell us what how things are going to change in this intermediate syntax, low and intermediate risk syntax score patients uh, with a normal ejection fraction and also comment a little bit on patients with a low ejection fraction and intermediate syntax score with left main disease. Well, so first of all, you've been doing your reading because not many people knew that the ejection fraction was basically normal, 57 in Excel, 60 or so in, in Noble. And that's a really, really important point. And so uh, the key thing about uh, this as a whole is that really this relates to low to intermediate syntax score patients who are randomized in the trial. And so before we sort of just go into practice and start indiscriminately stenting left mains, I think you've heard me say this, we have to be sure that we have the good training, we're doing good technique and the like. But nonetheless, I think my take home from both of those trials is that, um, you know, PCI is no longer only reserved for those people for whom surgery is contraindicated. I think we should still take patients off the table. We should still basically present other options to them. But at this point, I used to say, well, you know, the gold standard surgery surgery, we could do PCI. I don't think we have to say that anymore. I think we could say, at least in the short to intermediate term, um, PCI is, performs just as well as surgery and is less invasive with less complications. That's great. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and ask you about um, OCT. I've been uh, attending a lot of Ziad, all these talks, and tell us, not, not most fellows have uh, access to OCT. Uh, most of us do IVIS, even uh, at our program, I haven't done OCT yet. So how is this going to change? Like, would you say one or the other would be better, or it's okay to be trained in one modality and kind of ignore the other? What, what are your thoughts on that? 
So I think, you know, as a, as a fit and as, as somebody who's kind of like a learner for life, it's never good to ignore anything because I think you always want to learn as much as you can. And I use them both in a complementary fashion. I, I think um, Ziad's passion, he's, he's one of my partners and I, we helped train him, in, you know, once, once he became an attending and he's great. But he also is really good at IVIS too. And so you really need to use all the different imaging modalities together, including physiology as well, to be able to become a good interventionalist. And so I think that if you can get a good solid foundation in IVIS, and then as OCT maybe starts to emerge later, you'll figure that out uh, as, as well. For me, it's funny, I, I thought OCT was less intuitive to learn than IVIS was, but some of the software, software implementation uh, actually makes OCT a little bit easier. And I think that'll change with IVIS as well. So the bottom line is that I think imaging is here to stay, learn as much as you can, but then the key is not to overreact. And that I definitely see as an issue sometimes with OCT, where you may see a small edge dissection. I mean, for instance, in Illuminin 3, there are reporting major dissections over 20% of the time. These didn't have any clinical sequelae, at least or, or short term. And so if you went and treated them, mm -hmm. that might be too much for the patient. So I think the bottom line is just to be a clinician and understand the role for all of these things and then fit them into your practice. Great. And um, my last question for you is about the CHIP fellowship. So tell us, uh, interventional fellows, uh, what that's about and who should be doing that. So it's a, it's a big conversation, but the bottom line is actually one of the fellows in training, Ankur Kalra from the BI, wrote an, wrote an article on this. It's published in CCI, and we were I was a co-author on it, and we talked about the year for a second year of training beyond your sort of ACGME interventional year. And I think it could either be endovascular, structural, or complex coronary CTO chip. And I think the idea here is that you need some degree of super specialization beyond a generic interventional fellowship in order to truly, truly excel at one of those. And so for us, it's a year fellowship dedicated to, to uh, not just hemodynamic support, but CTOs, um, mechanical circulatory support, ECMO, VAD, you know, those types of things. And it's, it's a full year. And we did our, our first year was last year. And uh, we were really happy with how it turned out. But I think you'll see more of these uh, coming forward. Unfortunately, it means more training, yeah. which is not good for, uh, for fits on the go because you don't get to go anywhere. But um, you will eventually get to where you need to get. Sure. Well, the whole, um, uh, a lot of faculty have been telling us that if you're interested in training, it's always good to invest in uh, the training. That's been the whole uh, idea. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And I know you were going to support us uh, and uh, say a one-liner. Yeah, a absolutely. So there's there's two things. One is I think always keep all of your options open, your eyes open. Uh, for me, I kind of blew off my echo rotation a little bit because I was interested in coronary and endovascular, but I didn't know structural was going to be so big. And as a result, I had to go back and learn it all. So so the bottom line is don't over-specialize, but keep your eyes open. And then finally, keep doing these things, like at conferences and everything else. And so for those of you who kind of want more information about these types of interviews and the like at the meeting, uh, go to youtube.com, Fits on the Go. Thank you so much, Ajay. It was great having you with us tonight. No